Okay. Uh, well, I just introduced myself, but for the sake of the recording, since these are recorded, uh, I'm Jimmy Quadra. I'm a programmer from here in San Francisco. Uh, I do a little bit of app development and some operations DevOps type, uh, type work. Uh, and tonight I'm going to talk about open chat ops, which is an idea I've been working on for uh, chat ops that's agnostic to programming language. Now I have a big caveat before I start uh, with any of the detail of this, which is that basically everything I show you here is vaporware. Uh, there's nothing that you're going to be able to try out like the second you leave this meeting. Uh, it's mostly an ideas talk about how maybe some how could this work? Why would it be potentially useful? Um, some of the tools that I'm going to talk about do exist, uh, uh, some of the components for how this might work. Um, I will try to make it clear whether the thing I'm talking about exists or not when I mention it. Um, but if it's not clear at any point, feel free to interrupt me and ask for clarification. Oh, yep, yeah, this is vaporware. Okay, so let's uh, let's take a look at. Hang on a second. This did not sync. Well, oh, close enough. So let's uh, let's take a look at um, some of the background for what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, if you're not already aware, I'm the author of Lita, which is a chat framework for the Ruby programming language. Um, and I, I did this because uh, Ruby is my primary language, uh, and uh, Hubot was the one that, that GitHub created, which is um, probably the most well-known and most, most used. Um, these are the, the sort of the three major ones that we have today. That's Hubot on the left, Lita, and R, which is on the right. That's for Python. Um, and so these are sort of your three choices uh, uh, for like sort of major chat ops adoption. Um, realistically, the communities are a little bit more like this, but uh, we can ignore that for now and just pretend that they're all even choices. Um, now, really, in terms of functionality, they all give you basically the same thing. So uh, the, that adoption is really more in terms of how many how many companies and how many organizations are using it. Uh, each of these bots and uh, sort of the, the size of the ecosystem for open source plugins. Um, there's a great many of them for all for all of these, but especially for Hubot. Uh, so again, these three bots represent these three languages, which are, I guess, the you know in today's world, sort of the most common languages for uh, for, for, for dynamic programming and uh, certainly for web programming. Um, so web developers tend to be familiar with at least one of these, if not two or or even three. Um, so this is all good. Uh, you know, I think all of these programs have done really well, and there's a lot of a lot of programmers who know these languages and are getting a lot of use out of these frameworks. Um, but there's a few problems that having this divide between communities based on programming language um, kind of creates for us. Uh, one is that we have a lot of duplication between these communities. So certainly for the times where you want like the really basic obvious plugins, like the one that gives you a, a Google image or something like that, the, thing, the types of stuff that everyone uses, that plugin needs to be created three different times for each one of these languages, each one of these bot frameworks. Um, and for you know some of the smaller packages or some of the smaller bot frameworks that are not that I haven't been talking about that you know is again duplicating the same work across that. So I've been starting to think about is there a way that we could standardize what a chatbot is or what, what a multi serve multi chat service chatbot is and sort of in the style that that Hubot started um, so that these could interoperate with each other because um, it, it'd be really cool if there was a world where. I could choose which robot I want to run based on any particular features it provides. But if I at some point find a plugin that I like that happens to be in another language, I can just use it without having to know that language uh, and re-implement it in uh, whatever language the chatbot I, I chose happens to be written in. Um, the other reason is that you know people change what they like over time and what they find most useful. And sometimes uh, a particular language may be better suited to a particular task. Now, this is, uh, of course, totally subjective, but a lot of people will say that uh, you know, asynchronous programming is easier in the JavaScript sort of node world, where it's callback-oriented, everything is asynchronous by default. Um, you can certainly argue about whether that's the case or not. There's certainly ways to do it in Ruby and Python, um, but you can't deny that they were not built with that intention in mind in the way that, that JavaScript and node were. Um, so there may be certain certain uh, types of things that a plugin might do that may feel more natural in one language versus another. So even if 
uh, you're writing a plugin yourself for the language that you've written, you may want to choose which is the best language for the particular task at hand and not have to you know, settle for the one you picked based on which bot you're using. Um, if we think about this in terms of abstractions and what, uh, what abstractions ChatOps has provided us, and Hubot in particular, uh, the thing we've abstracted at this point is the chat service. So we have all these different choices for, for chat services. I mean, this is just a small number, but there's a lot more of them. There's also a lot of open source ones. I think uh, since Slack has come out and a lot of people are really enjoying the way that they are, that sort of their view on how group chat should work, there's been a whole bunch of open source clones of Slack. And I think those are really good choices for people who want to do chat ops because you can do a very deep integration where you essentially control every part of it and you're not relying on a third, a third party company that controls everything and may change the API in a way that you can't predict necessarily. Uh, I think mean, Slack is, in particular has been good about this so far, but uh, in the same way we don't want to tie our chat bots to a particular chat service, like you know, all these people who are now moving from HipChat to Slack, you know, what in the same way, what happens next year when something else comes out and they want to move from Slack to that other thing? So uh, having the this sort of abstraction, which is Hubot, which comes in and says, I will be the common API that talks to all of these services. So you author your plugins using my API. I will take care of the details for what goes on to make it happen with that, which whatever chat service you're using right now. So that gave us that abstraction. We no longer have to worry about our automation being tied to chat service. But we still have this lock-in on programming language that whatever we choose or whatever the plugins that we want to use are written in is the stack that we have to have to work with. Um, so what if we what if we expanded this and we said it's not only you know a matter of which of these three what sort of major frameworks we want to use, but it's now literally any language that's Turing complete. So here's just a few examples of a few you know um, more common languages that. Uh, you might consider writing some chat ops code in. Uh, I mean, there's certainly a lot of companies that are using uh, some of these other languages for uh, the, the basis of their, of their software, so their engineers may be more familiar with one of these other ones. And it could be a lot of different things beyond this. So really, the, the thing that we need is, for each language that we want to support, um, libraries that agree on the, the, on the common parts uh, such that they can talk to each other. Now, how is this ex is going to work exactly? Um, I think to to understand how how this would uh, how the tools would need to change to support this type of model, uh, we have to think about how they're built currently. So this is the sort of um, canonical Hubot architecture, uh, which is is shared by by all the major uh, chatbot uh, programs. So the the, bl the bl blue box uh, represents a single program or a single process running on your system. And within this single process, you have the robot, which is essentially a class in your uh, in your uh, your object space, and it provides an API for both adapters, which connect the chat robot to a specific chat service, and plugins, which are authored by you um, or you know another open source developer who talked to the robot. And so this is the abstraction that we were just talking about: is you program your plugins to the robot. And the robot talks to the adapter, and the adapter talks to the chat service. So the only thing you have to care about is the robot API. That's the part that's in common on both ends. Now, because this is all in one process, that means that all of this needs to be written in the same language, which is what we have today. If we think about splitting this apart, then we can talk about having these same components, but running as separate programs, uh, where each one is, is its own process, and they can be anywhere as long as they can communicate with each other over the network. So instead of, you still have these same connections between the components, but they cross the, essentially, the process boundary. So they're no longer necessarily the same program that's running. If we zoom in a, a little bit on this and we think about what is this line that actually connects them now, because before that line was just a method call inside your program, but now the communication needs to be external to the program itself. So we have this external connection between the components. Well, that line is quite simply a network. Um, so we're talking about uh, a network that could be local to the system. You could be using Unix domain sockets or uh, using uh, a TCP over uh, just across local host. Or this could be going out to the internet, talking to another server. Could be talking to something in a virtual private network. Um, and so, what is the what? What we need to do for these components to talk to each other is just agree on 
a communication format for what to send over the network. There needs to be an API uh, for the network calls themselves. Uh, and the way we can do that is with RPC. Uh, if you're not familiar with RPC, it stands for Remote Procedure Call. Uh, it's not a new concept by any means. It's been around for a long time. Um, and I think what, what um, current day web developers may be more familiar with, which is sort of an, an alternative uh, paradigm for, uh, for communicating with another program over the network is REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer. Uh, and the canonical example of this is HTTP, which basically everyone is familiar with. So uh, just a really simple sort of uh, basic example of the difference between the two. With REST, and this is what I think probably everyone is familiar with, uh, and using the example of HTTP, we speak to external services in terms of resources. So uh, in the canonical example of a blog that exposes its posts via an API, we use the HTTP uh, verb get to say that we're we want to read like, the contents of a resource. We give it a URL, which tells us what resource we want and which particular uh, element of that resource. So we have like a posts collection of resources, and we want post with ID number one. So we send an HTTP request. We say, give me a representation of this object, essentially, and it gives it back. So this abstracts the communication between programming languages. Um, and that's really its purpose, is to think about the objects that you're communicating independent of the mechanism by which the service or the client is, is uh, representing them internally. Now, RPC, in contrast, has, uh, I guess you could say, sort of more internal knowledge about how the other system works. So RPC is, is more akin to taking an actual function call in your code as a concept uh, serializing it into a form that can be sent over the wire, sent to this other service, which then unpacks it to its sort of a raw function call and just executes the function. So instead of saying it's like instead of saying you know give give me this this concept of a post, however you define it in a, a way that we share, it's saying literally execute this function that I happen to know that you know. So in the end, it, it kind of gets the same job done, but in a different mechanism. Now RPC, uh, it, as I said, is not a new thing. So here's just a small list of some of the very many uh, RPC frameworks that have existed over the years. Are, uh, some of these are quite old. Some of them are, are pretty new. Um, not all of these are, are necessarily RPC frameworks. Um, some of these are actually, uh, you might, might be better defined as a serialization format, but um, the two kind of go hand in hand. So I think the, the main takeaway here is just that there's a lot of choices. Um, and this is, this is a, a pretty well-proven concept for communication between programs. All right, so let's look at the details in a, a little bit more technical sense about how this would work for chat ops. Uh, like I just showed, there's a whole bunch of choices. So which of these protocols to choose for uh, the purposes of chat ops is somewhat arbitrary, um, but there are some considerations about uh, speed. And uh, I think one of, probably one of the bigger ones is uh, to think about uh, adoption so and support for programming languages. Uh, so we want, want one that supports a lot of programming languages, something that's easy for people to use, uh, something that has a, a serialization format that is relatively simple, because uh, the more archaic this gets, the, the more difficult it becomes to implement this stuff and to get people to use it. Uh, so this is not in stone yet, but for the project I've been working on, I am probably going to go with gRPC which is a, uh, a very new framework from Google. And gRPC is an RPC protocol that's built on top of a previously known, or a pre uh, an existing Google project called Protocol Buffers. Uh, you may have heard this term before, but not known what it was really about. Uh, protocol Buffers is uh, distinct from an RPC framework, is a, ser a data serialization format. Um, most of us know this as like XML, JSON, like a common way to represent data. And protocol buffers is exactly that, except that uh, unlike some of the more common ones, it uh, it uses a uh, a binary protocol, so it's sending essentially really compact data that doesn't need to be represented as text. And this was used by Google internally for quite a long time. Uh, the uh, earlier versions of it has have been open sourced for a while, and it's in use by a lot of different companies and organizations. And uh, you know, this is essentially a way of defining uh, a schema for an API in a language agnostic way, and you use a tool that compiles 
the schema that you've written into a relatively idiomatic code for a particular programming language that it has to support. So you have, for example, a file that defines the schema for your API, and you run a program that generates a client library based on the schema for C++ or for Go or for Ruby or for Python. And so all that needs to be done is a client, or a, essentially a compiler needs to exist for protocol buffers into the target language. And if that exists, then it can easily support anything you can write a schema for. Uh, so V3 uh, is a new, is actually a beta version of protocol buffers that is required by gRPC. Uh, so when I mentioned earlier that uh, this stuff is kind of, uh, kind of vaporware-ish, this is not vaporware, but it is beta. Um, so this is not something that you, we would use in production at this point. Um, you know, the spec is not totally finalized. Uh, protocol buffers uh, is still kind of a work in progress, and gRPC is a work in progress on top of that. It is being used, obviously, by Google. Um, there are other companies using them. I happen to know off the top of my head that CoreOS uses it for uh, etcd, which is their uh, distributed data store. Uh, it's a distributed key value data store, uh, and they're they're experimenting with converting their HTTP API, which has been used up to this point, into gRPC for the next version of etcd. So this is being used. Um, here's a here's a diagram actually from the gRPC website that I think will make it a little more clear what we're talking about here in terms of the sort of the network architecture. Um, it's really pretty simple uh, in, in that it's you know it's it's a it's a server client model for clients to be able to access an API that's a, that's uh, served by uh, a server somewhere. Uh, so in this particular example, we have uh, you know a, a stack of servers running in our data center, and then we have clients that are represented by a laptop computer and a mobile phone. And you can see that they're written in three different languages. So the, the service providing uh, the API is a gRPC server. So this is something that listens on the network like any other server, like a web server. Uh, it's written in C++, and the API itself is defined in these protocol buffer schema definitions, which is then compiled into C++ code, which runs the server. And then on the, the other side, we have uh, uh, in the blue boxes, it says gRPC stub. Uh, a stub is essentially exactly what you would expect from uh, any sort of API client library, which um, um, I think probably everyone has used at some point, uh, like the AWS API or uh, you know, any, any service that you're using will have a client library that represents in the common idioms for your language a way to communicate. Uh, with their API over the network that abstracts the fact that you're talking to something over the network. So you just create an object like you know EC2 instance and you say new and create or something like that, and you're not having to think about HTTP or how this is actually being transmitted to, a to AWS. Uh, so that's the same idea here. You take those same schema definitions that you use to build the service, and you run the compiler targeting Ruby and the compiler targeting Java for Android, and you get a, a client library that knows how to talk to a service, um, and it can be written in any language because the serialization protocol is protocol buffers and is language agnostic. So that's what the blue arrows are representing here. We have this proto request and proto response. Uh, that's the protocol buffer format that is used to actually transmit the data. If we take a look at what a protocol buffers file looks like, uh, and specifically this is using the protocol buffers version three syntax, which is what that line at the top is saying, it's sort of an opt in to make it clear to the compiler that we're using the newest features. Um, the comments look like they don't show up too well on the slides, but I'll, I will read them out loud so you can see what it says. Um, so we, we start off with package hello world, and uh, this is just a, you know, pretty much what you'd expect. It's a way of scoping the current file and giving it a name. Um, if your, your service uh, becomes you know, any non-trivial size, you probably won't want to split components across multiple files, and this is a way to import the messages that are defined in one file into another. Uh, so this, this top block here is uh, for a service greeter, and this represents the service that is serving the API. So in the, in the example we looked at a second ago, that would be the C++ service that's running in the server farm. So we're, we're saying declaratively here that we have a, a service called greeter, and it has R, a one RPC, which is essentially a function or an API endpoint. Uh, the, the, the function is called say hello. It takes a hello request as an argument and returns a hello reply. This is very straightforward. So basically it sends a greeting. You send it your name and it's gonna send you back hello your name. 
Um, so these these individual uh, data objects in protocol buffers language is called a message. Um, it's essentially a struct. So it's a it's an object that contains named fields, and each of these, the hello request and the hello re reply, are both very simple objects that have a single field um, name and message uh, respectively, and their uh, primitive data types are both string. Uh, if you're wondering what the equals one part of the message definition is, that has to do with uh, optimizations uh, about how the binary data is sent over the wire. Um, if you think about something like JSON, where you have uh, an object that has key value pairs, where you have name equals Jimmy, uh, you know, uh, speak, uh, talk equals uh, open chat ops, um, then every time you transmit this object over the network, you're sending uh, the name of the field as well as the data of the field. But if you're talking to a service that has previously agreed on what the fields are, then as long as you keep the data in the same order with uh, a way to delineate when one field ends and one start, or the next one starts, you don't have to include the name of the field because it knows what they are based on the order. So the reason you have this number here is because it allows you to evolve your uh, protocol buffers based schema over time such that regardless of which order you list the items in, in, in the file, the number defines what, uh, what index it is in the order that the bytes actually exist in when it's transmitted over the network. This essentially allows you to do for, uh, backwards compatible APIs when you change what's inside one of these structs. And that means that even if you have a new version of this, old clients that don't know about that field can safely ignore it because they just stop listening when they get to a field that they don't know about. Uh, so once we have that protocol buffers file, we use the protocol buffers uh, and gRPC compiler, and it generates for us uh, this uh, essentially an idiomatic Ruby class that's this hello world greeter service object. Uh, and in order to implement the service, and, and, uh, and this can be done in any language again, all we have to do is create a, a class that inherits from this generated uh, object and implement that say hello method, which is the RPC that we defined on this previous slide. So you can see that RPC say hello, that takes the, re the hello request and the hello re and returns hello reply. That's exactly what this is. So we have a method called say hello, takes a hello request, and it returns a hello world hello reply, which has that inner field in it, which is the message that says hello to the, per the name of the person who made the request. Uh, and that's as, that's as simple as it gets. Um, to actually run the server, the gRPC also comes with the actual network server logic. So this is what you would do to start up the server. This is essentially what uh, starting the process would, would actually do. Um, we just listen on a port uh, on the network, and we tell it to use that class that we just defined as the thing that it will execute when RPC calls come in. Uh, so now that we have the service running, uh, we want a client that will speak to this. And those are generated, again, from the same protocol buffers files. This is an example of a client for the thing we just looked at in JavaScript. Uh, where we run the, pro the protocol buffers compiler targeting JavaScript, it creates us this greeter object, and uh, on the, the it puts it in a hello proto um, uh, module, I guess. And it's very simple. You just create a client using it. You tell it the network address of the server that it's going to be talking to, and then you just use it as if it was a method call in your in your local program. Um, so this is what the this is in that 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 slide earlier that was showing sort of the diagram of how the communication works. That's all this is. This is the stub. This is the thing that, to the user of this program, it just looks like a local method call. And behind the scenes, it's actually sending RPC data over to get its responses from a, pro a process on another computer. Um, so this is sort of the, you know, quite literally the hello world of gRPC and protocol buffers. If we want to think a little bit about how this applies to our domain of chat ops, uh, what are the things that become structures in our protocol buffer definition? Uh, well, here's a you know sort of a extracted uh, subset of what the robot API looks like. So this is the this is the API that the robot exposes. Um, currently, this is all language specific, but with this technique, um, this will work to any client that knows how to talk that has been essentially compiled from uh, this definition. And so you can see that these are the like a few of the common uh, actions that uh, these robot services provide even currently across languages. So the ability to uh, tell the robot to join a, a chat room, to leave a chat room, uh, to send messages to a chat room, 
uh, and then the listen API is how a plugin would essentially register with the client and say, I am the plugin that does this, here are the messages I'm looking for. And now the service, as it receives messages from the adapter, can send a stream of events across the RPC network and talk to the plugin and say, here's an event that targeted you and just pass it on. And then the individual plugins can handle this. So I think uh, the main question to think about here is uh, in a world where you're no longer bound to your programming language for how to implement these plugins, uh, what are the benefits of doing this? Like, what, what's the, what, is this worth it? Because it seems like a lot of extra complexity. Um, and I think that's the main question uh, for me as I've been thinking about this idea is uh, it adds some complexity in some ways and it, it, it gives you freedom in other ways. Um, I mean, sort of when I, when I talked about the problem uh, at the beginning of this talk, I was saying um, you don't want to be isolated to a particular programming language because you may want to use tools from another one. Uh, you may want to use existing plugins that aren't targeted at your bot. You may want to change what language you want to use for your new plugins without abandoning everything that you've written before that point. So I think th those are all really useful things to have. Uh, and I think that the added complexity here is, is actually really not the details of the RPC um, protocol, because that is essentially what the chatbots would provide you. So if we thought if we thought about a future a potential future where let's say the, those three chatbots that I discussed, GitHub, uh, sorry, uh, Qbot and Lita and, and R, uh, they could essentially become client libraries for this protocol so that they execute in one of two states. You can say like you can execute Qbot as a command line application and that starts the service which then needs has plugins register with it and talks to the chat service. And then it's also requirable from, in, in, uh, from inside a JavaScript program as a library, which impl implements this, the club, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the client stub side of this. So that's for plugins to use as a library to talk to the service. Um, so for plugin authors, it doesn't really change anything about the way the plugin works. They use the same APIs. It's just talking to something else over the network behind the scenes. Uh, and so the, the burden of, of this complexity uh, would be on the author of the framework and that's a much smaller subset of developers and people's time than uh, having people rewrite all of their plugins. So there, there's, it could, be, it could certainly be possible for, at least for a subset of functionality across these major chatbot frameworks, to have existing plugins that already work today be able to communicate with each other without having to be uh, you know, rewritten to support some new protocol by using a method like this. Um, the other thing to consider in terms of complexity is, uh, you know, the complexity of deploying a chatbot. I think that's the one that could potentially be a problem, or at least expose things that could be kind of thorny in some cases, uh, because right now you, you know, you install one language environment onto your server. Um, you know, you uh, you have you have your one language environment. You have uh, one way of installing plugins for that one program in that one language. All of the stuff, all of the different components are running in one process. So there's really only one thing to do. Whereas in this world, uh, you would need a way, you, essentially you need service discovery. So you need a way for uh, the service to know which plugins it should be sending events to. The plugins need to know where the, ser where the robot service is to be able to interact with uh, the chat service and to do what it needs to do. Um, and so that, that part I haven't explored much yet. I have some ideas for how it might work. Um, I think it would, it'd probably be uh, easy and beneficial to take advantage of um, sort of the revolution that's happening right now with containers about having uh, each component of this running as a container in an isolated process, which makes it very easy to package. You can just you know install a container from an image registry uh, and just execute it with the same program. So if you're using something like Docker or Rocket, it could be as simple as just having a manifest that says, here are the, you know, the 25 plugins I'm using, here's the sort of the, the robot service that I want to use that just all points at public images. They all instantly download and they all know how to talk to each other via you know, the, the container systems uh, orchestration. Uh, so obviously the detail, and that's, that part, that idea is, is, is completely vaporware at this point. Uh, it's just something I've been thinking about. Uh, so if this interests you at all, if you think it's a good idea or a terrible idea, I started uh, an organization on GitHub, Open Chat Ops, 
Um, right now, there's just a couple of repositories there. Uh, the main one is just called spec, and it's just a markdown file that kind of describes everything I've been telling you here and has uh, some very, very small uh, charts to the actual protocol buffer schema definition for what a robot would be, what a message would be. Um, and because this stuff is, you know, because the because gRPC and protocol buffers v3 are still in a beta state, uh, I don't anticipate having anything demoable of this anytime very very soon. Uh, but as soon as those things start to stabilize, I think um, it'll become a re real possibility to to try this approach. Uh, the other um, other project on there is just uh, what I, I plan to be sort of a reference implementation for this concept. And that obviously doesn't exist either because it relies on the rest of this being sort of uh, specked out and, and certainly more well-defined. So that covers what I wanted to talk to you about. Thank you very much for listening. Anyone have a question they want to ask? Yeah. Okay. So uh, I expect that anything in terms of authenticating requests, how do you know proof requests versus Right. Um, so that's an, that's another concern is the authentication model. Um, the question was uh, how do you, how do you make sure that the requests that the server is getting are from who you think and someone who's authorized to make those actions. Uh, so yes, that that's another concern. I think in in the existing frameworks, it, it's pretty easy because you essentially just give it a group name with a string or something like that, and it it uh, it has no ability uh, no ability to be forged from the outside in a sense. And it's just talking locally within the program. Um, I thought a little bit about it, but not. I don't have any specifics to share. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, gRPC is actually built on top of uh, the HTTP 2.0 protocol. Um, so any of the existing authentication me mechanisms for HTTP, including basic auth, SSL client certificates, um, you know, to token-based auth with OAuth, anything you can do on top of that can be used with this. Um, how, how that would be surfaced as an API by the by the robot framework is not super clear to me at this point, but it's certainly possible technically. Um, another thing I, I also forgot to mention about a benefit of splitting these apart is that it actually makes it safer for um, you to use open source plugins or even from kind of accidentally stepping on yourself. Uh, because right now, uh, in these in a, you know dynamic language like this, you install an open source plugin, uh, especially in Ruby, which is the one I'm most familiar with. It's all one giant namespace of objects. There's no file scoping in Ruby, so everything can mutate everything else that exists in memory. So if you if you install um, if you install an open source plugin and you didn't look at the source code and vet that the source code of the thing you looked at online is actually what you downloaded. It's very, very trivi trivially easy for that program to access the, you know, the contents of the database under another plugin's namespace. Uh, so, you know, anything that you're keeping that's important not to be mucked with there, that's not encrypted, that's fair game for anything that has access to the Ruby process. Um, by putting the plug, each individual plugin in, uh, into its own program and separating them at a process boundary, you now have all the tools of, uh, you know, your systems. Uh, uh, tool toolkit and uh, you know like the, the whole system uh, the whole Unix uh, world and all of the all of the networking stuff that you can use there's all of these different levels where authentication and authorization can be enforced uh, so it's it's a can of worms but I think um, it could potentially be uh, much more secure than we have today yes um, is there a reason that you choose to use RPC over some other protocols like you know, web sockets because you're using HTTP2. So it kind of tied you to kind of IM based service. So if you have web sockets, you're, you create persistent connections rather than having these, you know, rather than having established connections over and over. So um, it could be done either way. As I said, there's a lot of choices, and it's to some degree it's kind of arbitrary. Um, to address that specific point, um, one of the changes in HTTP/2 is that it doesn't. It's much more efficient in terms of holding a connection open, and that's one of the main reasons that it was started. Uh, so you have a bunch of compression and uh, keep alive type stuff that's built into the HTTP/2 spec that effectively makes it work the same way as what you're describing. Um, so sending individual requests across will be as performant as a WebSocket connection and work in much the same way. Um, like you, you, you can also multiplex across HTTP2, which is not the case in, uh, in previous versions. 
so you can hold a single TCP connection open, and you can send, you can essentially do unrelated transactions to the same service across the same TCP connection out of order, which is not uh, is hacky if if at all possible in in previous versions of HTTP. So I'm not an expert on on the protocol at that level, but it's got a lot of efficient stuff, and like you know, Google picked it for this reason that uh, as the sort of the, the backing for uh, the way they wanted to do it. Uh, so yes, it, it would also be possible to do REST, um, uh, and I think, uh, and that there there are some advantages of that as well, in, in the sense that the client then becomes just an HTTP client, which is obviously implemented by every language under the sun. So you have a you have an adoptability um, sort of aspect there that you have ma you know easy mass adoption for anything that uses the the bare bones HTTP that everything supports. And then if you have to go through a proxy or somewhere along the way, you could go through. Easy. Right, right. So it, that's the that's the major benefit of using HTTP. That despite any of the warts in the network protocol itself, that if the adoption is so large that you have a massive set of tools that you can use. Yeah, I just like you have actually bridges enable access to gRPC services through REST. A uh, comment from Guillaume that you, you can actually access gRPC services through a REST protocol, so it's not not necessarily one or the other. That's that's yeah. cool. I didn't know that. Uh, but anyway, this is why you know this stuff is just it's just brain you know kind of uh, brainstorming like how how might this work? So uh, like I, I mentioned, like I'm not totally settled on this has to be gRPC. That was just uh, it seemed like the best what will probably be the best choice. Um, but I, I also you know kind of spec this out a few months ago, so. As we know, technology moves fast. So, if you have ideas about this, I'd love to have some discussion on the uh, issues on on the GitHub organization. Let's see, you know, what's the best way to to achieve this if if this is something that would actually be useful to people. Yes. Would this require re-implementing all of the adapters for the various services? Um, because, like right now, you know, the Qbot IRC adapter is obviously very tightly coupled to that particular robot. So if you were shifting some of the components around there, um, at least would you have to re-implement those adapters against a new API that the, the robot is then talking to? Um, you might only have to do it once, yeah. um, and then all the robots get it, but. Um, the question is, Do would the chat service adapters for the robot framework need to be re-implemented? I think the answer is not necessarily. Um, well, we should look at this slide. Um, for the same reason that I talked about the plugin, so the, the robot is really sitting at the, in the middle between the plugins on one side and the adapter on the other side, and the robot itself is actually completely abstracted from the chat service. So the robot, as as an object or as a program, doesn't speak directly to the chat service. Um, so if, if compatibility, if to maximize compatibility in the same way that I said, uh, as long as as long as those same APIs that are used now for plugins to use are exposed from this sort of language neutral robot the adapter api is exactly the same it's just a set of functions that take certain arguments and return certain other values so the fact that the that the communication is happening across that white line that didn't exist before doesn't mean that the api has to change so what would change in any of those plug in any of those plugins is the you know the adapter framework or whatever provided by the library would know how to talk back in this RPC protocol, but the methods themselves wouldn't change in that given language. Um, you know, it may not be true. It may not turn out to be true in practice that it's really as easy as that. There may be little little things that you need in order for the network protocol to work that would be harder or impossible to do. I haven't really looked into it that much, um, but theoretically, there's no reason why the API exposed to the programmer should have to change because of the communication mechanism. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, the uh, main concern when I see this kind of project is that usually it takes the common denominator with all the features, right? How you plan to for the adoption and to be sure that it follows up with uh, you know, the latest features of the bot, how do you plan to manage that? So yeah. you're not respected by that. Yeah, the, the question is about um, the fact that when, when you try to create this kind of interoperability, there's a new, you, you now have to uh, abide by a new lowest common denominator in that 
they all are bound by the abilities of the other bots, which is currently not the case. So we sort of have this healthy competition of like, ooh, R, uh, R has this cool feature that Hubot doesn't have, so I want to try that out. Like, there's a reason to use one bot over the other. They're not just an implementation of the exact same thing in a different language. Um, that is a concern, and we've oh, I think we've already seen that. I, I mean, certainly working on Lita, I've seen it with uh, the same abstraction we have today, which is the abstraction of chat service, uh, where people are, especially since Slack started, that's really been the major sort of uh, kind of conflict that we've had is, how do we have this, you know, the robot provides this very generic API with just the basic stuff that you know every chat service is going to have, but suddenly everyone's using Slack and they say, well, how do I use Lita to uh, send a Slack attachment and how do I do text formatting and stuff like that? Um, and obviously the simple answer is that uh, you can't because, or you, you, you can't expose that as a common API. So if you're using things that are not common, then you can still use them, but it binds you to that part that's not in common. So people today that are writing Lita plugins that, and there actually is a, a way we decided on doing this, which is essentially uh, the adapter can choose to expose a chat service object, which is something specific to that chat service. And so you can program against it if you happen to know that you're using a particular adapter, but then that then locks you into that adapter for that functionality. So I kind of see this in a, in a similar way uh, in the sense that uh, to, to be for a plugin or an adapter to be maximally interoperable, it would have to limit itself to the to the baseline as you described. Um, and if it wants to do things beyond that, then plugins written for it are necessarily locked to that particular implementation. Uh, the other thing I, I, I think though is that when I think about what the actual difference is between all of these different bot frameworks, uh, the, ba the basic parts are really the only part that need to be abstracted. Um, if I think about even, I mean, obviously I know Lita the best, most of the features in Lita are about conveniences of how to do things inside a plugin, like uh, I, want it to, I want an HTTP client that's easily integrated into my plugin so I don't have to do a bunch of setup. I want uh, a timer that executes something after a certain amount of time has passed or on a regular interval. Those are things that make the, the business logic of the plugin easier, but are actually not at all specific to the API of talking to other plugins. So the things that would need to be to, would need to be uh, sort of ironed out to be in common would be sort of a standard data storage API, uh, and that could even be adapt have sort of an adapter layer. So they're like in in the case of Lita, it's like bound specifically to Redis. That obviously couldn't exist anymore in this new system. So there would have to be a my plugin requires the Redis backend or my plugin requires the Postgres backend or something. So you could have constraints on particular plugins to say, which parts of the of the, the shared ecosystem do I need in order to run? So you do, you do in some sense get into potential sort of dependency hell there. Um, but I think more, more likely than not, the, all the variations are going to be not that many. There's kind of going to coalesce around the much more common things that people are going to need. Uh, so I, th I think there's some danger there, but uh, it's not unworkable. Cool. Thanks very much.